live and on YouTube live. So welcome. This is the first time I've done this. Uh, it's going to be interesting. So uh, I was fortunate enough last fall to um, head to Eastern Idaho on an adventure of a lifetime. And I was there for three weeks shooting three different TV shows, four or five different TV shows, actually. Um, and I got to meet a group of people that were absolutely fantastic when it comes to um, uh, the fisheries that are there on Highway 20. Highway 20 spans from Idaho Falls all the way up to the Montana border uh, in Yellowstone Teton territory. And it is the angler's artery for everything fishing. There's some world fam famous rivers and creeks there, including uh, Teton, the Snake River, uh, South Fork of the Snake, Henry's Fork. And what I'm most excited about today is Henry's Lake. So for still water anglers, Henry's Lake is Mecca. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a, uh, it's a put and take fishery. Uh, you are allowed to, to harvest some fish, but the fishing there is on fire. And we were fortunate enough to be there as the elk were coming out of the hills in the fall when everybody was switching from hunting or switching from fishing to hunting, which means that we had a lot of the water body by myself, by ourselves. Now we were in a small town called Island Park. Island Park um, is basically a gas station and a bunch of lovely people. But in Island Park, there is a lodge and a fly shop called Drift. And the owner of Drift joins me today. His name is Mike Wilson. Mike, thanks for joining me. How are things in Island Park, Idaho today? Uh, just going great right now. We keep getting good word every day, so uh, no complaints. I'm glad to see that you're healthy and safe and everybody in the Drift family is good. Um, how are things there right now with respect to all the shenanigans that's going on in this world? Uh, I don't, we're pretty lucky here in Idaho. Our governor's opened us up for most any activity right now. So as of last Saturday, non-residents can get their licenses and come fish in Idaho. Um, very few re uh, restaurants are still semi-restricted down to about 25% occupancy, but most are also doing takeout. Uh, then Montana's governor announced that he will go to phase two on June 1st, which will also allow us to get into Yellowstone Park through the West Gate on the 1st. That's huge news for you. I mean, as, as many people may or may not know, the season for um, trout fishing in your area actually opens up this Saturday. So Correct. it's right. So that's, that's, you know, that's your excuse to jump on highway 20 and get up to the, to the, to the, to the lodge and the fly shop. Now you are a full service fly shop, but you also have residences there as well. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Uh, we have 15 rental cabins. We, can do package deals. We can house parties from one to 25 uh, or groups from one to 25. Um, and we, we have guided services for obviously Henry's Lake. I'm partnered to do work in Montana on the Madison, Hebkin, uh, and then some private waters along with all the waters in Yellowstone Park. That's fantastic. And if anybody, if you haven't fished that region, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to say this and some people may not like it very much, but Montana gets all the love for trout fishing in the West. They really do. If people think of trout fishing, they think of Montana. Well, there's other states in the West that have fantastic trout fishing and Idaho is definitely one of them. It, it is. And you know, just as an example right now on the lower Henry's fork, big bugs are flying. We've got salmon flies out. So we're, I'm looking to see a surge in fishermen again here. Well, even now people even should, now. They'll, they'll be flocking down on the lower Henry's fork. Right. Perfect. So when we were there, we, we had never met before and we spent five or six days fishing Henry's Lake together. And I had a friend join a friend and a coworker that, um, that, you know, Phil and I have been working together for a number of years and we've never actually got to fish together. So it was a real treat for me to have the Stillwater fly fishing guru named Phil Rowley come and join us in Island Park at Henry's Lake. And uh, amazingly enough, 
Phil joins us today. Hi, Phil. How are you? Hey, Mark. I'm good. I'm good. So Phil is in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. I'm in Toronto. And of course, Mike is in Island Park, Idaho. Isn't this technology fantastic? I love it now. Once I've got used to it. <laughs> it's great. It's great. It's, uh, it's kind of changed. It's, you know, the world's changed a little bit. And so how, how we communicate has it. I think it's a little better. It's a little easier. It's nice to see faces. It is. It is. You know, I'm cooped up in the basement a lot um, and doing editing and writing and things like that. So to see see old friends face to face to face is 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 ideal. Um, Phil, Henry's Lake, tell me about Henry's Lake from an expert's point of view. It is one of in North America. It's one of the to me, one of the still water destinations you have to visit. It's it's got a perfect it's everything you need in a lake. It's very productive. It's got diverse species of fish. We've got uh, rookies, um, Yellowstone cutthroat, and then the uh, Yellowstone uh, rainbow hybrids that grow to massive sizes. So you've got uh, opportunities for different fish and for some incredibly large fish too. And it's easily accessible. Uh, you can fish it with a big boat. You can fish it with a mid-sized boat. You can paddle around with a belly boat or a float tube. A uh, number of access points. And the whole lake is just so nice and shallow. Um, it's all fishable. That may be its curse, too, because they can be anywhere. Well, it's perfect for fly anglers because, you know, you do say it's shallow. It's a big, It's yeah. basically a big bowl. And I think yeah. the maximum depth, Mike, is, what, 15 feet, 16, 17 feet? Yeah, yeah 17 is – but there are a few deeper holes. Yeah. But for right. fly fishing, that's when you're a still water fly fisher, you like that water that's 20 feet deep or less. Yeah. Um, because A, you're going to get sunlight penetration, which is going to stimulate plant growth through photosynthesis and create nice habitat um, for uh, all the food sources trout feed upon. And uh, of course, from a presentation perspective, we can do lots of different things. We can fish strike indicators. We can cast and retrieve with a variety of sinking lines. We can fish floating lines and long leaders. We can anchor up. We can drift. There's lots of different things we can do. Whereas other lakes, you may be confined to a bay or a shore where that's possible. The rest of the lake's too deep to do so. So um, when when the gods made uh, thought of stillwater fly fishers, they had Henry's Lake in mind. <laughs> Well, and we'll get into it a little bit more, but we had an absolutely epic week fishing fishing Henry's Lake. Uh, Mike, Jim McCormick uh, is asking a question. How are your bookings for this year in Alaska with the 15-day quarantine for people coming up here before they can be guided? How are things going? Uh, our bookings are slow. We just, and a lot of it is due to uh, the travel ban. Idaho just dropped the 14 day quarantine requirement as of the 16th. So last Saturday, um, Montana will drop theirs on the first. So our bookings right now are, we got lots of cabins available for anyone that's ready to come up. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, the, the accommodations are fantastic. Um, they are, uh, we got to stay in the main lodge, the big lodge, which sleeps 12 with a full kitchen. And, uh, you know, we made our own meals. We had a blast. It was super comfortable for, you know, our crew. We had a number of camera guys and, and show hosts and Tom Rosenbauer was with us and um, from Orvis. And uh, yeah, we weren't on top of each other at all. It was absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. Um, let's talk a little bit about the species that um, that Henry's Lake has to offer. Phil, um, you're, a, you're a trout expert. You, you built your business fishing trout in moving water and in still water. Um, you know, what species can you expect to tangle with in Henry's Lake? Well, you've got uh, brook trout. Um, and Mike can probably speak to this a little bit more. I don't know if they're recurring naturally now, Mike. Is that correct? Uh, they were no, right now. They, they, they were and the fishing game has slowly tried to uh, take care of the natural reproduction. Most of them are triploid planters. Okay. Well, that's so a feral planters. Yeah. But triploids get big because there's no growth development to the gonads or the sex organs. So all they get to do is once they realize that they're um, not going to be able to reproduce, they just get to eat. And of course, you've got mm -hmm. native Yellowstone cuts there. And then the the uh, trophy fish, the ones that get really big, are those hybrids, those cutthroat rainbow crosses that are uh, pretty spectacular fish. Yeah, they are. I mean, we we went into our week fishing together, Phil, hoping to get a um, a Henry's Lake Grand Slam, which consists of rainbow trout, a hybrid, and a brook trout. 
um, excuse me, a, a cutthroat, a brook trout, and a hybrid. Yep. And um, I went in expecting to be lucky to get one in a week. We got one we got, in about 10 minutes, didn't we? We got one every day, at least one every day. It was, it long. <laughs> it was, in, it was absolutely insane yeah. and just tons of fun. Um, yeah. uh, Drew Allen, Mike, is asking, with ice off happening early in May, do you expect the fish to still be along the shoreline for the opener, or do you think most of them will have moved offshore by then? Uh, I think there'll still be a good majority in the shallows and in the shorelines. You'll find around the state park that they'll stay in there for the first two, three days, and then the fishermen push them out. Yeah. It, right. It's it's really the fishermen that push the fish out of the shallows. It, and it's no, also, there's some water chemistry issues too, because as the lake has been frozen over, although Henry's is pretty shallow, it may not stratify in the traditional way. But uh, that's where the most oxygenated water is in the shallows. And then mm -hmm. as that lake warms and as soon as the ice gets off and you get some of that beautiful weather you have down there, it's going to warm the shallows and that's going to um, spread them out a little bit and get them more and healthy. the cutthroat are also going to be near the tributaries right now. They're just finishing up their spawn. Yeah. Uh, so you'll see a lot more that way in the shallows also. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, the makeup of the lake. Um, is it spring fed? Are there uh, tributaries that come in? Um, what's the water like? What's the vegetation like? Tell me a little bit about the dynamic of Henry's Lake. Uh, me or Phil? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, and, both. And it, it's both, really. It's spring fed. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Staley Springs off the top of my head, a famous uh, location on the lake, and there's lots of little creeks uh coming into the lake as well that's um the fish are going to take um use of as make use of as well i was just looking at my map and counting what i can see on the map right now and i i can see eight little tributary spring yep. stream tributaries and we know of numerous other uh underwater springs other than staley's that's in the lake yep. also yep. so even when it looks dry, it's still getting its good share of fresh water. One of the interesting things about people that want to come to Henry's Lake and maybe bring their own boat um, and do it do it yourself, uh, obviously making a stop at the, at the fly shop is key. And one of the reasons for that is because these guys are on the water all the time every day. They know what the fish are dialed into. They know what fly patterns are working, where they're located. But there's also a piece of literature that you can pick up at the fly shop that is a detailed book written by um, one of the local legends named Bill Sheese. Um, and Mike, you sell those books there and it has a detailed season by season um, manual, if you will, on how yeah. to fish Henry's Lake. And he's even got his holes drawn out, favorite holes per what time of year. And he maps out his bugs along with that and, and you uh, carry his flies too don't you Mike? we do we have you, a full one of the exclusive uh, shops he still provides flies to pretty much yeah um and we have the best thing is we have bill here once or twice a week to drop in and share a little more knowledge too um but yeah we carry i'm trying i'm just counting i think i've got around 75 patterns of bills yeah. That we, yeah, we were fortunate enough to, to meet him when we were down there. And it was, uh, I've had that uh, book of his for a number of years. It's been my little um, guide to the lake as I tried to learn it with previous trips. And uh, it was a real honor to meet him and, and talk about the history of the lake and the development of his flies and all that kind of stuff. You know, what I found it, what I found interesting about it, Phil, was when we were doing our interview with him, um, you asked him the question, you stuck your neck out big time in writing this book. This is a lifetime of experience on this lake that's been documented day in and day out, um, basically just purged onto paper yeah. and then made and then given away, made for sale. Um, the question you asked him was, are you still a hated man? And what was his <laughs> response? <laughs> um, he said he had a few people that were not happy with him. Uh, but overall, I think the response was pretty good. And, and, and kudos to to bill for doing that because as a visiting angler that's the kind of help you need you know mike's got his maps up in the shop and that really helps too and that in support with bill's book can really give you a fighting chance because henry's lake as shallow as it is it's still a big body of water and it, yeah. it's it's taken a while you know i fished it 
you know, probably 10 times when this last trip was the best trip I'd ever had on it because you're, you know, you're learning. And even though you, you know, just, you may be comfortable on a lake, you still got to put your time in and learn. They all have their little nuances and yeah. little, you know, um, characters that you got to deal with and figure out and stuff like that. That's the fun of it all. But it was, it was a real pleasure to meet Paul and, and again, kudos to him for actually, you know, making that hard swallow and putting that down on print so the rest of us could benefit from his experience. Can I, can I say something there on Bill and, and the most hated? He's everything but the most hated. You go out there on the lake with him, you have to fight for a position around him. Yeah. And uh, there is, you're not going to find anybody who's really going to say anything negative about Bill. He's, he is a great person. No, and I always look at, sorry, I always look at that stuff on any body of water. You know, some people get upset with that kind of thing, but it's like, well, how did you learn? Like we all learn from passing on knowledge and mm -hmm. nobody gets hit with a beam of light overnight and they're instantly smarter. At least I'm not. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that, that's the beauty of the sport. That's what the new fly fisher is all about is teaching yeah. this kind of stuff and putting this stuff out there so everybody can enjoy it. It's not like there's enough water out there for everybody to, to uh, have an enjoyable day on the, I've seen I've seen Bill give away m many flies out there, so yeah. to get to get people onto the fish and going, so it, he's a great example. So, Mike, let's talk a little bit about um, the fly fishing and the conventional fishing that's there. Uh, it it the season is open for ice anglers, but the population of fish in Henry's Lake can support a put and take um, fishery. What? Are, what's the density of fish on average, if you know about what, what it's like in Henry, Henry's Lake? Oh, geez. <laughs> I, I, the, the, no, I don't, I, I couldn't tell you a density. I, I wished I could. I can tell you our numbers are off the charts this year. Yeah. As, the, as you saw last fall, I mean, it's only as far as we can see better right now. Um, you know, fish and game plants approximately 1.3 million fish annually. Wow. Well, of all three species. Uh, that, of all three species. Wow. That's about ab about 900,000 cutthroat and then uh, 250 or so uh, hybrids. And then, then 30 to 50,000 brooks. Wow. And the brook trout get quite large, don't they? Uh, yeah, Idaho. Henry's Lake has the Idaho State holds the Idaho State record, and we honestly have been waiting for that to fall. The, the fish, the fish well, are in the, the fish are in the lake. We've I've had reports of fish that would have broke the record catch and release, and they didn't they didn't document it. So. Well, we brought a renowned Eastern brook trout expert, Mark, in, and <laughs> we gave it our best shot. <laughs> and, we, and we caught a lot of brook trout. You, know, you lit up whenever you caught one of those. Oh, man, I love those fish. I love those fish. There's we nothing... had... Go ahead, oh, Mike. We've had reports of over eight pounders being caught. Eight pounders. Six eight pound brooks. So what's that, about 17 inches long and about... <laughs> It pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Size of an NFL football. Hey, Mike, Sandy, Sandy Sorensen brings has Briggs has a question for you. Um, what are your recommended flies for opening weekend? Oh, well, I, it, that was a convenient question. I happen to have some sitting here too. <laughs> uh, Bill, she's flies, no doubt. Uh, yeah. Well, and a few of our own. Uh, electric black leeches um, going to be our first go-to. I don't know. If you can, there we go. Yeah, yeah, we. I remember that fly. <laughs> and then the one of the major go tos early seat, and I dropped it. So the electric black, the electric leech that I had my success with, um, is a bead head, bead head, and it it literally lit lit it up. Um, I used basically three flies all week and um and two of them were, <laughs> were black electric leeches yes. <laughs> we also went to the number 12 the smaller one at the and you started seeing a lot of success there but on to the other flies i would look for uh the purple showgirl <laughs> this time mm -hmm. of this time of year she 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 knows how to hook those big ones and then um 
a lot of streamer uh, type patterns. This one is specific to our shop. Um, tied a little bit different. Uh, uh, great imitation. Uh, the coloration. The darker this time of year seems to be the patterns. Uh, along with the Halloween this time of year. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. You, you were, you were using very similar yeah. too last. Yep. So yeah. all of those are really good, you know, and then as you saw with me fishing around you guys, I even spread out our, you know, I have my patterns that I like too. Yeah. So uh, a, a good variation, the uh, brown, black peacock, that Bill ties is my number one. Well, you did well with Renegades too, didn't you? I did. Yeah, Henry's Lake Renegade. Yeah, Henry's Lake Renegade. Yeah. yeah, usually at this time of the year they'll be eating, um, you know, the hatches. What's the what's the average temperature right now, Mike? Our uh, outside temperature. <laughs> <laughs> I lost. No, we So don't lie. <laughs> um. Probably around 50 degrees for the daytime high. Yeah. Now, you know, we have a special treat for the fishermen on the forecast for the opener, which is one to three inches of snow. Hey, That's just it. like what we had. I <laughs> know. <laughs> I have to extend my stay. Um, yeah, because at that time of the year, your hatches probably won't get going until that water temperature warms. So your, your sort of core food items are on the menu, leeches, scuds, yep. uh, bait fish that live in the lake as well. And then yeah. you start to see those coronament emergencies come off. That's that's what excites me. <laughs> Phil, when does when does the fish what temperature does those will those fish turn their metabolism to start really chasing chasing larger protein? Usually we use in lakes fifty Fahrenheit as the yeah. magic sort of um, let's get going. Um, you know, after they've been under a cap of ice, they've got to adjust to um, you know light levels of change. Right, they've been under in the darkness for a while, so there's it's not like they, they don't have pupils like we do. So there's just a period of getting used to the new. To coin a popular phrase these days, their new normal, um, and um, they're also cold-blooded, so their metabolism—they're going to be a little slow and lethargic until those water temperatures warm and get their metabolism stoked up. So, 50 Fahrenheit's usually a, a good guide uh, that we use just on lakes wherever I go. And my guess is we're got to be somewhere around 45 right now. John Anderson is asking, uh, John, I think you're you're referring to the electric leech uh, when you asked this question, how, and maybe Phil, you can address this. Yeah. How is the electric leech different from a woolly bugger? Um, from my perspective, the only difference is the electric leech didn't have a hackle on it that would have made it a bugger. And that's right. what we are fishing, basically leech bugger style patterns. Um, the, you know, the Halloween is basically a version of a woolly bugger, you know, body, hackle, tail. Um, same kind of thing. The electric leech is just a, a dubbed kind of mohair body um, with a black tail and a bead on it, right? So, and a little and a little bit of flash added yeah, in the dub. You've got, you've, got, you've, got to have, you've got to have that flash in there. A little bit, you know, not too much. Not too much. Uh, Dustin Quick, uh, is the state record different out of the outlet, and what is that record? Uh, I, no. The state record is out of the lake. We don't see very many brooks in the outlet other than what's spilling out of the lake right now. Um, so if they're talking about that, but the outlet is on fire right now, we with all the fish moving up and the numbers in the outlet below the dam downstream, probably three miles, the fishing is great. Well, great. Good stuff. Miguel Perez Ortiz is asking uh, what renegade. I'm asking. I'm, I'm thinking he's asking what is a renegade, or or is there a specific renegade he's looking for? Henry's Lake goes with basically two favorites, and these are two of Bill's top twelve. So your Henry's Lake renegade. Whoops. <laughs> it's backwards. Oh, and that's the Mighty Mouse. Sorry. Uh. The Henry's Lake Renegades hackled on the front and back peacock with an olive head. And then the half-ass Renegade, yeah. as you can see, just has your back hackle and the red head on it. So those are the two favorites on Henry's Lake. That Mighty Mouse that I grabbed accidentally there, uh, it, it's a fish-catching little... Son of and, a gun. And, and, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying to keep this clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this is just water, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. You you'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the important thing that a lot of people get um, really caught up on fly patterns, and they certainly play a role. But it's the presentation techniques you use, and and that was key to our trip was figuring out at that time they were pretty active and willing to chase. So we were able, we, we certainly found our success jump markedly when we started picking up the tempo of our retrieves. Absolutely. Fish lakes. It's a slow thing. It's a patience uh, game. Uh, and you know, some people, if you're, if they're used to fishing rivers and streams, which is a little more dynamic, casting, moving, stripping, picking up to sit in a boat or sit in a pontoon boat and just, you know, slow right down. People often struggle with that. Most people in lakes, uh, don't retrieve their flies slow enough and, and don't let them get down deep enough to where the fish are. Yeah. But in our case, we had the fish were hanging out the creek mouths, um, staging up around there in those shallow weeds, um, feeding voraciously and willing to chase. And, and that yeah. made a difference. One of the and, things that I found that was really, really un unique about our trip there, our um, adventure was the fishery was really dependent on the wind as well yep. and you know we couldn't strip the flies in fast enough when it was glass calm they yep. would chase like crazy. faster you faster you're stripping those flies in the better off you were second thing is the bigger the wind and the waves under an indicator the more action was on was put on those flies yep. and the bigger the it was a little bit uncomfortable at times you know with with the wind but you yep. know getting getting those flies moving as much as you can it just yep. the windier it was the better the fishing was well, I think when it gets calm, um, they feel a little bit more exposed. Um, you know, they can't, you know, a rippled surface masks their presence and they'll come in shallow. And when you're picking up the tempo, you you could argue we may not been getting a feeding response out of them. We yeah. were um, triggering a grab out of them and they would just see it go ripping by and respond to it that way and kind of throw caution to the wind. Yeah. And when that chop comes on the water, they're a lot happy. It's like a riffle on a stream. They feel a little happier a little safer, secure, and more likely to feed in a natural way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sandy Briggs, again, does uh, cloud cover versus sunlight affect color choice or not so much? And we get this a lot. Yeah. In every situation, every guide has got something different to say. Yeah, and I, I look at, there used to be that analogy, bright day, bright fly, dark day, dark fly, but it, it's there's lots of fact, because we always tend to think of th looking vertically, how the light hits our flies, but you got to also think horizontally, how, how's, how the fly gets lit up as well. And, and generally, I, I fish natural colors um, most of the time. And if, if you're looking for fly color, to me, arguably the best way to figure out fly color is what color are the weeds. Because the food sources you're going to be imitating are going to be matching that weed color. It's not safe to be hot chartreuse in a dark olive background, right? You're not yeah. long for this planet. You're going to get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that'd be more my guide. And, you know, some days, um, if it's bright and clear, I tend to use more natural somber colors. So if the water's really clear, um, the sun is bright, it's calm, I tend to be more natural, not as much flash. And yet, if the water's got lots of suspended matter in, it's kind of murky, then you're going to use a little bit of flash, maybe some, you know, um, crystal chenilles or dubbings with flash in them uh, to pick up any available light and draw fish in to, to have a look and hopefully eat them. Mike, what about you? What do you say for uh, for fly color? Uh, I, I'd like the – I go along with Phil and the natural, the blacks and the olives for Henry's Lake. Um, I also see – from being here all the time, it's not necessarily the sunlight; it's the water clarity. If yeah. we've had a high, if we've had a high wind day prior, uh, get, as Phil said, get that flash in there, get a, get a little bit to get a little something a little to catch their eye, but stay natural. Yeah, yeah, especially uh, with big fish, they tend to be a little bit more wary. Um, they didn't get big by accident. I don't know if they're necessarily smarter. They're probably the most scared fish in the entire lake with all the trials and tribulations they've had to get to to get to that size. So if it doesn't look natural, they're not um, they're not going to get it. Uh, and what's considered, I mean, for me, any any day on the water is a good day. Um, but what, what uh, Dave Woods is asking, what's considered a good day uh, for those species? Oh, well, I can give the fishing game numbers. You know, they have a target number of, I'm calculating this out. Basically, uh, two fish, 
on an app for the average fit. This is average fisherman, not fly, you know, not an experienced fly fisherman. They work on approximately two fish in three hours. Uh, truthfully, right now, you're going to be talking oh, a fish every 10, 15 minutes yeah. with, with the numbers that we have. So it's on how long you want to stay out there and how long your right arm holds up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually if you pull into a spot, they'll, you know, they're in there. If they're in there, they're in there to feed. They're not going to look at your fly 762 times and on 763, they snap on it. If it goes by them and they're in the mood to feed, they're going to eat it immediately. If it looks good to them to eat and present it properly. Yeah, I would uh, think uh, you should be able to. It's hard. These are always tough questions. I know they're really tough questions. It's, it's impossible to actually give a, give a number because for me, I don't even count fish. So No, I you know, I uh, people ask, I always go, well, more than one and less than 100. <laughs> yeah. kind of, and like I'm saying, a good get... time. it's a pretty spectacular place to to, to uh, chuck a fly because you've got the confluence of the three valleys. You've got Sawtell Peak, all the other peaks. Um, you know, we had moose we could see. There's always a chance of seeing a bear go wumbling by as well. All the different waterfowl. It was when you weren't catching fish, you weren't bored. There was something else to, to look at. Or, of course, there's always. You know, Mark and I chirping back and forth to each other as well. <laughs> little little well, I, walk, I walked out. I walked out and got in my car to drive down the shop yesterday morning and uh, looked up on the hill and got treated to wolves. Oh wow! Ooh. So they're in after the elk now, huh? Yeah, they're up there for the calving elk. And uh, Chris Street, any luck from shore? Do you have to fish Henry's Lake from a boat? Uh. Boats, boat fishermen and float tubers are by far the most successful. Yeah. Henry's Lake is a tough shore access lake. There are a few specific spots that you can do do well around the state park and off the cliffs or, you know, the main areas. However, you know, I, if you've got a boat, bring it, use it. That's, that's usually true for most of the waters because fishing from shore – I love to do it, but usually you've got issues like private access, um, trees in the background behind you. Usually as a lake angler, we don't have to worry about trees too much in a boat. Um, uh, you know, the weeds that fringe the shoreline, you can hook a fish beyond the weeds, but how are you going to drag it back through to land it? Um, and uh, often, you know, Henry's is a very productive lake, tends to have soft, gooey, muddy bottoms. Yeah. Um, and you take one step in there and you're up to here. So, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and you yeah. want your waders. You don't want yeah. a wet weight, Henry's yeah. Lake. <laughs> no, 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 no. And you need that mobility to move around. So if they're not at uh, uh, the cliffs, you can move, you know, up to Pintail and all this stuff, which we did because Kevin's, our guide, Kevin, had, was such a, a wealth of knowledge on the lake and where to go. I, I, can't, I, I can't recommend that enough. If you've never been to a body of water, river, or lake, you have an opportunity to invest in a day's guiding. They'll just teach you the nuances and what what works, and it'll be it'll be it'll make your trip so much so much more uh, valuable. How many guides do you have working out of the out of the shop, Mike? Uh, six currently. Six. Yeah. Great. So. Great. What do you like for midge colors for opener? Red. <laughs> yeah, that would be yeah, red. Would be more bloodwormy, but um, yeah. Coron the number one coronamid color is black. Black with a red rib to me is if the ice cream cone color. Yeah, uh, yeah. Henry's you'd probably go with a, a white bead ice cream cone because it is a little cloudy water. It's so productive. Um, but yeah, black is the most predominant uh, coronamid color out there. We, don't, we, don't, uh, we can, don't forget small micro leeches. Um, because they work very well um, throughout the season, but particularly fall and um, um, right after ice off. Well, let's talk about the fall time. Um, actually, let's address Cody's Cody's question here first. Are the brook trout typically nocturnal, or can you have success during the day? We Cody, we caught all our fish yeah. under the high yeah. bright sunshine of of the day, yeah. and uh, and oftentimes upon pulling up to a spot, the brookies were the first ones to eat. They're pretty aggressive. <laughs> I find them. I find them as an early more. You know, probably more early morning fish throughout the year. Um, but I, you can catch them anytime. Phil, let's talk a little bit about our presentations um, when we were there. We were there in the fall. 
Um, uh, the weather had, I don't think the lake had turned over by the time we had gotten there. Um, um, I, can't remember the I don't think so. And I don't, I don't know think it is, had. I don't know if yeah. it turns in the traditional way. It's so shallow that I don't think, I think the sun's rays penetrate right through the bottom. So that's going to keep that water temperature consistent throughout. It probably gets the majority of its aeration through just the wind circulating that water, bringing that, you know, lack anoxic water up, diffusing it, going back down. And the springs help too. I don't know if it um, like nearby Hebgen would probably be more, would, would stratify more because of its depth. Henry's Lake is so shallow. I think it gets its from the inflow streams, the springs, and just the winds, as you know, that can rock through those valleys. Right. So let's talk a little bit about our presentations when we were there. Cause when we're shooting the new fly fisher, uh, and we're also shooting an episode of Stillwater episode of the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing as well. Hence the reason why Tom was there. Um, we, the way that you and I started to fish together was natural in that we, we would we would dissect the water column such that we were both fishing opposite to yeah. try to figure out what the puzzle was. Let's talk a little bit about presentations and uh, how to approach a brand new lake. Well, with that question, wow. <laughs> um, well, well, majority of the times fish are going to be feeding probably within one to two feet of the bottom. Uh, it's safe down there. They're not going to, you know, we saw a few white pelicans around. So, you know, cruising into shallow water where they can get within their reach is not good. Um, and that's where the food is. So we were trying to get down there. You were fishing, uh, as I recall, a, a fast sinking sink tip. Um, and I was using more slower presentations just trying to see what they want. Do they want it fast? The, the analogy I use for finding fish, I call it DRP. Um, and this is sort of the priority I do it. Depth, get your fly to the right depth, that you know, just above the bottom usually. Um, retrieve, figure out do they want it fast, slow, medium, right? And then you start figuring around pattern because there's so many pattern variations. And every sadly, everybody throws all their marbles into the pattern bucket um, because – if the pattern's not working and you know the pattern's good, unfortunately, the only reason you're not catching fish tends to be the person driving the fly. So uh, you've got, and that's not a an insult. That just means you've got to change something up. You've got to um, try a different line. Uh, you know, you were, you know, your line sank so fast at seven inches per second. You had to go fast because you would be hanging up all the time. Yeah. I started with a clear and actually a hover line then to a clear and immediate, and then I went to a type three because the faster retrieves on average were working better. Um, and then we still had, I still pulled out the strike indicator and hung some leeches under there and, and that worked too um, as well because the beauty of fishing an indicator presentation is your depth is controlled by your distance between your indicator and fly and your retrieve can be a strip. It can be just left to sit and bounce around or you can creepy crawl it in using a hand twist retrieve. So lots of variations there. Well, I, and I, and watching you with an indicator underneath, uh, with flies under an indicator, uh, some casts, some presentations, you would include all four with a big pop at the end. Yeah. And oftentimes that big pop at the end of your cast was enough to, uh, or, or even just slowly raising your rod tip, like you're going to go into a roll cast yeah. was enough to incite, incite and eat. Yeah. That's um, called the hang. That's if you want to add catch to your fish, particularly when you're casting and stripping is to incorporate the hang. So what the hang is, is, is a lot of times fish will follow your fly for a, a while and they're interested, but they're not committed. And you raise the rod to cast and you get grabbed as a swirl, a flash, and you miss the fish. So what you do is just as you're bringing it in and the real lines we're using have those hang markers in. So that was excellent for that. It's a little mark on the line about uh, 20 feet from the end. So you can either hang what I'm, you can do the hang at the rod tip or down at the reel, use that to whatever works. I tend to hang, um, at the rod tip when I'm using shorter leaders, just because there's a bit of more separation between uh, myself and the boat. I mean, the fish in the boat. So what you're going to do is right is just as you're going to go in, you're going to almost like a roll cast motion. You're going to bring that rod up, raise it or hang it and let it sit there for, I've done it. I remember doing a fish on Henry's Lake up by um, Pintail, 25 seconds. I hung that thing. I just let it and a little cut rocketed up out of the weeds and ate it. Um, so they're following and when you raise the rod, you change the fly's direction and you change its speed and that triggers them. You know, it's a flea response. It's like running away from a bear. If you walk away, you might be pretty good. If you turn into a sprint, you're probably going to get chased down and pounded. Um, and, uh, so that hang really, we got a number of fish that way, stripping it in fast and then raising it up slowly, 
pausing for a sec. If there's nothing there, you can cast, of course. But a lot of times, you're just looking at your fly, and this fish rockets up and eats it. And that's pretty exciting to watch that's that It's very happen. exciting. Especially if it's a monster hybrid. That would that would scare you. Um, Mike, Drew Allen is asking, any advice for how to target the larger fish in early season? It seems catching an average Henry likes fish, Henry's like fish is fairly easy. What advice do you have to target that larger class of fish? Great question. Um, oh, I'm, I'm going to say sit on the outer edges of those shallows, not right in on the shallows. I'm, I think they're going to be hanging just outside the mass of the, all of the fish. Slow presentation, get, get that if you're indicator fishing. Uh, the very successful indicator fishermen, like Phil has said, their, their goal on Henry's is six inches off the bottom. Um, and then a, just a slow retrieve with your leeches and other streamer patterns. Yeah, you, you gotta feel? put you gotta put yeah, I agree. You gotta put your time in. Those big fish are wary, so they're gonna be hanging on the edges because they want an escape route. If something doesn't um, fit, you know, their their model of safety, they're gonna get out of there, right? And you, you just gotta put your time in. We were fortunate enough to get a big fish, but it took us three days, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, you know, they feed at certain times of the day. They're they're very wary and selective, and it's a lot of times it's just gotta put your time in. You might have to go through a, a lot of brookies and cuts. I know it's hard. <laughs> well, um, yeah, eventually, you might uh, be fortunate enough to tag into something big as well. The the other good thing for to help with the big fish here in the early early season is we haven't seen the snowfly hatch yet, so they're yeah. not going to be gorged and stuffed. So it might be a, just a hair easier to entice them prior to that hatch showing up. Cool. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, Jordan Beck, what side of the lake seems to produce more, Mike? Oh. I mean, these fish are cruising all the time. From uh, I'm, I'm going to go from observation for this time of year. I mean, generally the cliffs early season it seems to be one of the more – and the south side of the lake seems to be the most productive – but right now I'm seeing way more fish up between Pen Pintail Point and the Wild Rose. Um, the reason I'm saying I'm seeing the fish there, the pelicans are there. Gotcha. They're, they're going to be worth it. Those are some deeper stretches too, aren't there, Mike, in there? I know off off the cliffs it was pretty deep. The cliffs is, yeah, the cliffs is probably the deepest section of the lake. And then that yeah. channel – from pintail over to wild rose, you're going to be looking 12, 13 feet. Yeah, they're going to be, you know, slid there. Uh, yeah. Is Henry, sure. yeah, is Henry's Lake similar to any Kamloops? Yes. Um, probably the best comparison, I would say, Henry's is very similar to Tunkwa. Shallow, um, less than, I think Tunkwa is 17 feet deep. It's very similar. Uh, similar size, too. I think Henry's may be a little bigger. Um, but basically one giant shoal full of weeds, full of scuds, full of leeches, huge coronamid hatches, damsels. It's got all the major food groups there. Um, so, yeah, very, very similar. Your tactics, I'm a big – I often get asked, you know, well, do your flies work in Mexico? Or, well, I don't know. I haven't been there. Yes, I have, but that was saltwater. But anyway, do they work in New Mexico, I meant to say, or do they work in Ontario? Do they work here? Yes, they do. Fish don't have borders. They don't know right the food sources are common across north america and your tactics that you use at home will pay big dividends when you go uh, to another place and a lot of times you bring something unique from your area and kind of introduce it to that area as well and vice versa it's that's the fun of the sport absolutely and sorry mike let me just cut you off there real quick oh, um one of the one of the things that has really uh, that i've learned in fishing with with experts like phil Rowley and Tom Rosenbauer is that, you know, it's not all about the fly. Nope. It's about the presentation um, and the size of the fly. Uh, and if you can match, if you can match the profile of the fly and figure out a presentation that these fish are looking for, chances are that'll unlock the puzzle more quickly than it will color or the actual fly. Would you agree with that as well? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> The presentation always trumps pattern. Um, That's a good question. From Chris Street, can you or should you try two flies like a dropper style? We fish two flies all week. 
Um, yeah, and I, I always joke, I spent a lot of my um, younger days in British Columbia, um, some great stillwater fisheries there, but you're only allowed to fish one fly in that province. So when I moved to Alberta and you can, we can fish up to three, once you open Pandora's box, it's hard to go back. So I was using combinations all the time. I was, in fact, one of the combinations was a, I remember using was a bruise leech, balance leech, oh, where's my camera? Uh, balance leech and bruise, that's just black, blue, Arizona semi seal on a jig hook with a tungsten bead on a pin. And then also this baby leech worked well. Oh, i got to get my camera orientation figured out here. And that's just a smaller jig hook with a slotted bead. And they like that little bit of orange on there to stand out in the water. So I was fishing that combo a lot with the bigger fly. This one, the bruise leech on the bottom. And then this one hanging off a separate dropper under an indicator about 24 inches up above it. And that worked pretty well because you can experiment with fly size, fly color, and depth all with one cast. And if, if one particular fly is getting the attention, that could be, usually it's a clue that's where the fish are cruising in the depth. So if you can um, change your presentation to target that depth more efficiently, um, you should catch more fish. Mike, uh, what's the regulation where you are with respect to how many flies you can, you can fish at once? Um, there really isn't uh, a limit on the lake. So Phil, Phil could have really gone wild. Um, so making rig, nine. <laughs> <laughs> At a school so, so, I, I seen a friend I seen a friend of sorry. Phil's one sorry. day pull up a string. I'm I think he had six flies on. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> I usually oh. use two um is enough, especially in, in Henry's Lake. It's, if you're fishing under an indicator, there's only so much water to work, and you're mm -hmm. trying to target that bottom third or quarter of the lake anyway. Um, so there's only so much water to hang flies. And I just find when you add a third fly, your tangle, your tangle coefficient goes off the dial. That was <laughs> it's the way like, All of a sudden it's like, what is going on here? But two flies is, is more than manageable. And I, I use that most of the time. It's the most pleasurable way. The experience of the fly fisherman. I mean, I don't want to put a two fly rig on a beginning fly fisherman. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. No, and it's also how you tie the fly on, a lot of different dropper options. Most I, I like my flies to what I call swim in their own water, so they're off dropper tags. Right. Um, I can change flies quickly. Uh, one fly's action isn't inhibited by the other. A lot of people fish tandem where they tie off the bend of the hook, and if you were a beginner, that's the one I'd recommend um, because the flies trail each other on the cast, right? They're not as likely to foul and tangle. But you are right, Mike. If you're just starting out, one fly is more than enough. What do you think, Phil, about tying uh, off the eye of the hook instead of the, the bend of the hook? I still don't like it. I, I just that you've got the, you know, my thoughts are the you tang got the tangle. The, well, the factor, tangle, right? and, and when you tie something to something else, you limit its movement. Right. Right. So because it's it's. Um, you know, one fly, if it's heavier, is going to influence the lighter fly somewhat. Um, and also changing flies can be a problem because you got to cut everything apart. At least with droppers, right. you can cut off and tie on like you like you ever like Real you quick. literally do. Yeah. Uh, Brent, we're going to come back to this question, Brent, uh, to talk about the rivers. Let's yep. finish up Henry's Lake first, and then we will come back to rivers. Let me make a note of that so I don't forget. Hi, Brent. Brent's from my neck of the woods. I saw him out on a local <laughs> lake on uh, Friday. Oh, nice. So, uh, I saw some pictures on his social media pages. He did well. So, uh, yeah. All right. Another one from Sandy. Loving, loving Sandy in this. Do you have any yeah. guides available for opening day? Uh, that question, that answer would be yes. However, I don't recommend sending guides out in that kind of a zoo. It, it's just not going to be a good experience for the, especially a beginning fisherman on Henry's Lake. Yeah. Uh, if you really want to go, we could probably work it out, but the lines at the boat ramps, uh, just the number of people. Uh, I want you to have a quality experience, so I would recommend giving it three days. Nice. Good advice. Uh, my son, Matt, is is every five seconds throwing <laughs> that up, so just maybe, hey, buddy, hope your lunch went good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with all this COVID-19 stuff, I've got, if you don't know, Ontario canceled all the school year. 
So these these poor kids have been locked in the house since the middle of March. So my hat's off to these boys for being as awesome as they are and, and keeping themselves busy. Uh, last year I had some luck on spoons on Henry's. Do you think spoons and spinners are worthy alternative on Henry's like for opening day for your conventional anglers out there? Definitely. Definitely. You're, you're going to see the majority of the fishermen out on Henry's opening day are going to be spin casters, spoons, bait. Um, it's an equal opportunity lake. <laughs> As uh, yours is an equal opportunity shop too, right? Yes, we have we have all all we help everybody. So um, I I would be looking for some of the bigger spinners, the little half ounce Panther Martins, Cam Loops, uh, on those lines, and both flashy and uh, red and white type colors. So good old Daredevil, <laughs> good old Daredevil, good old Daredevil. Yep. So let's talk about other fishing opportunities in the area of Island Park. Uh, Mike, what have, what have you got? What's, uh, I, I mean, I can speak till I'm red in the face, blue in the face, red in the face. I was out fishing this weekend. Um, uh, about what's available. Um, some of the trout opportunities are just absolutely world-class, aren't they? They are. You know, and Henry's Lake is headwaters of the Henry's Fork of the Snake, also known as the North Fork of the Snake. Um, the 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 whole Henry's Fork right now is fishing great, and I think what I think we mentioned it earlier, but people are going to find that the big bugs are flying down low. Uh, actually, I'm hearing from Stonebridge down, so they'll be moving up and hitting even up here around the upper parts of the river in about ten days, two weeks. Um, other rivers and streams, uh, I'm very lucky here at the Drift Lodge. We're only 20 minutes from the Madison. And, and <laughs> I like the Madison. Phil, Phil, Phil's laughing and smiling. It's such a great river. Um, and then into the park, we can be inside the gate in the park on the upper part of the Madison, 25 minutes, fish the fire hole. Um, we're leaving out another huge Stillwater opportunity. Can't forget Hebkin. Well, even and Quake. It, it, Hebkin, Quake, Wade, Cliff, all, all, all of them. All of them. Hebkin's been fishing off the charts right now. Um, chronomid under an indicator, uh, and and, and for the craw crayfish over on the North Shore. Yeah. I don't know what I left out. You know, I know you've got a show coming up Friday that's going to be on the Lower Henry, on the Henry's Fork and South Fork. So, um, yeah, that'll give a good indication of what the fisheries are like in the area. Um, and you know, from from Island Park to uh, Idaho Falls, it's a short it's a short hour and a half drive. So you've got all of those fantastic rivers that um, are all within a very 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 short driving distance um and the guides that that we've used kevin skendendor was our, our henry's lake guide he was amazing with with his knowledge of the lake his willingness to stay out late and long and to um put up with two canadians up, put up with two canucks yeah that's that's a big deal eh uh, <laughs> um yeah, it's a great, you know, the river opportunity, that's Blue Ribbon Trout Country. It, it is. The first time I went down there, when I fished the Henry's Fork, I was just looking down at my legs. I'm, I can't believe I'm standing in this um, in hollow river. river, this yeah. hollow ground, right? And I often say that's why I love to fish the lakes in the area because the rivers are so popular and so well known that the lakes often don't get the attention they deserve. Like you mentioned, like Hebgen. You can go there in August and have some great calabatus fishing, um, you know, gulpers, all that stuff. And there's hardly anybody on the lake. But the Madison is, is looks like uh, uh, Costco. There's just so many people there, right? So uh, bumper boat, bumper boat, bumper, bumper boat fishing, yeah. Uh, but and we're diver di excuse me, deservedly so because the Madison is just from from basically uh, where it comes out of uh, Quake Lake right down to the town of Ennis. It's just it's a dangerous drive, I always say, because you're too busy looking at all that 
primo trout water and not always paying attention to what's in front of you, right? And the curves in the road and pronghorns and other vehicles. So, well, and one other, you know, I, Mark, I got to fish Box Canyon for a little bit, and you know they, they, they're touting six thousand fish per mile in Box Canyon. The numbers are great. It's fishing great right now. The good thing, it's right below Island Park Dam, so the water is condition is good, stays fairly clear. And it's a it's a low it's a low release system too, right? So it doesn't yes. really get warm in the summertime. Um, and what's interesting is that that Box Canyon stretch is just upstream from Mesa Falls, um, which means that there isn't any brown trout that are up in that system because they can't they can't get past. So it's a strict rainbow rainbow fishery and it is just lights out good. Yeah. Pretty hey. humbling though, 6,000 fish per mile and you caught 10 in a day and thought you had a I good know. day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did catch some donkeys in there though. So there's some yeah. big Box fish, Canyon. Box famous. Canyon. Yeah, there's some famous for some big fish living in there. So speaking of big fish, Phil, mm -hmm. we fished with Mike and his crew for three or four or five days and yep. you managed to lock horns with and i'll use the cliche a fish of a lifetime but i actually believe after watching your reaction upon release of that fish that that was a fish of a lifetime for you give us some details on on that big hybrid and, and what yeah, went down that, that day that was pretty special we were just casting retrieving i was using a type three the new rio fathom line uh really liked that line and uh just fishing like we've done we we've, we've been catching hybrids and brookies and, and cutties and you know smaller ones up to 20 inches and and having a good day and then i just uh, made a cast and something ate it and it just felt a different <laughs> and then once i set into it it had a mind of its own and i was uh, hanging on for dear life for a little while and uh, and all i was fishing was a uh, it's a fly it's a woolly bugger variation of mine called the that I got from Manitoba, it's called a black beaver and tan. So it's basically just a black tail, uh, brown and all, uh, brown and black variegated chenille with a black hackle and a gold bead on it. It's just a bugger variation. And, um, and about, I think a size eight I was using it, or maybe even a 10. And uh, yeah, that was, I knew something was different and uh, it didn't show, it didn't cartwheel or do anything like that. It I was just being dragged, you know, we, I was just hanging on. And when it made that first pass by the boat, my eyes must have tripled in size because, the, you know, first of all, that's what we came for. You, you know, when you're filming a TV show, you hope that you get to something to really punctuate why you'd want to um, do what we're doing and come to that location. And, yeah, that was my fish of a lifetime for Henry's. That's the biggest hybrid I've caught and probably ever will be uh, for a while. Um, and it was, you know, anytime you can get a stillwater fish, uh, 10 pounds or better is, is pretty special because they don't happen every day. That's something you aspire and chase for years, right? And it's just luck of the draw sometimes. Well, that was a special fish. And mm -hmm. conservatively, we estimated that fish to be about 13 pounds. Um, yeah. It probably, it was fat. It was fat. It was a fat fall fish. Yeah. It hadn't um, missed too much food. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, he, yeah, he, he was good. <laughs> she, she was a good eater. Like a and, uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, and she swam away um, yeah. on on her own accord, but it was it was an absolute giant, and they are there. Yeah, Every once are. in a while on the lake, you hear somebody hoot and holler, and you know that they've got a well, a, a giant on. When the day before, somebody had got one fifteen. Remember, um, yeah. not far from where we got that fish um, in the deeper water near the cliffs, I think it was at that time. So um, they're moving around in there, um, and. You know, it's often a random, random encounter, right? There's, um, um, you got to put your time in those, you don't get those fish every day. And that's what makes it special and makes all the effort worthwhile. What kind of tippet were you using? How heavy was it? Uh, poly rope. <laughs> 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 uh, no, I was just using, I think I was using, uh, it might've been three X or two X. Mm -hmm. I always try to get away with the heaviest tippet I can get away with my, my, I always joke if I can get the, uh, tippet through the eye of the hook, it's all good. Um, using non-slip loop knots so you get that maximum action out of the fly. The fly isn't um, tight to the tip, so it, it moves. It's strong. And because of the weed, sometimes you got to pull through and, 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 and do all that. You don't want to break off. And also so you can horse a fish or try and control a horse, but a little ex 
trying to exert a little control on it because it could have taken me into some of those weeds and we never would have seen it. They could have wrapped yeah. up in there and, and we would have been done. So you always want to, in a catch and release scenario, I want to fish as strong as I can get away with to fight the fish quickly, get it in, admire it like we did, and then watch that big tail slowly sweep off into the gloom as that fish happily goes back, vowing never to eat a woolly bugger again. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it was it was an awesome awesome fish and and you know what we did get our grand slams we each got a grand slam a day, and um, it was just one of those one of those trips that you don't soon forget and that was really one of you know my first trip to Idaho, and uh, it was I'm going back I'll be yeah. I'll be there for I, sure. I hope to be there in September. <laughs> yeah, so let's uh, so let's talk a little bit about about what's happening in September. We're, I'm very thankful Phil wants to come back and fish and have another chance at that 13 pounder, but we're going to do, we're going to do a hosted trip with Phil on uh, September 10th, uh, 11th, 12th and departing on the 13th, uh, offer some seminars in the morning with Phil, take you out where we've actually reserved a private fishery for Friday, the 10th, um, so everyone can get some one-on-one -on -one time with Phil out at Sheridan Ranch. And then the 11th, we'll fish Henry's Lake. Uh, I've got the cabins reserved. We're maxing out. I'm trying to limit it to 12 people so we can get time with everybody and everyone can have a good experience. Um, uh, we're providing lunch and dinners. Oh, great. That's why I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, free food, free food. So along with our cabins, I've got prices set up that are both for single or double occupancy, depending on how much you like your fishing partner or if you, or, or if somebody can't fish with you. <laughs> so um, I, we're, I'm very excited about that. This is the first uh, event of this type that I'm, that we're taking on. So it's the first event that you're taking on, but Phil, you're an old hat when it comes to hosted trips. Let us know a little bit about what somebody can expect um, in joining you on, on a on a destination. Yeah, we're basically going to set everybody up so when they get on the water and, and have a chance, they're going to have the best chance of success. So we're going to go right through the gear you'll need, rods, reels, lines. We're going to put out equipment recommendations prior to coming right. so you, you at least show up um, with you know, and if you fish with what you've got, I'm not trying to encourage everybody to go out and, and um, you know, invest in something that they're not sure of yet. But um, and then, of course, understand the, the bugs, the food sources, presentation techniques, how to move the fly, different leader setups, how to set up for indicators, how to set up with sinking line techniques, um, all of that kind of stuff, how to read a lake, um, the seasons lakes go through, all of that kind of stuff, because lakes are different than rivers. They have their own little uh, nuances and quirks and the more you understand the environment you're fishing in and the, the fish you're targeting the better you're going to do you know phil you've created a, a a career out of fishing still water i know you're a fantastic moving water angler as well but you've yeah, really you and brian have really have done a fantastic job at at creating a lifestyle um uh for yourselves around still water fly fishing uh you've taught me that it is super exciting it is a, um, Mike and I were joking before this, this interview that, you know, what I said, Mike, why would you ever choose a niche of a niche? But then I experienced it yeah. and there's nothing like figuring out that puzzle and catching fish in still water. No, cause the, the fish generally in a productive lake, um, they're big, right? They have the, they have the perfect environment to live in. They, they, um, they really don't have any current to fight like you do in a, in a river. They just get to swim around and eat all the time and you know lakes like henry's that are you know uber productive that are just chocker block full with food um you know that's one of the reasons a, a big fish is tough to get because you're trying to fight with not so much catching that fish but with the other eight million scuds that are living in the lake or, or leeches or whatever um you know what makes yours a little different so lakes are productive lakes like henry's or have the capacity to fish you know trips of a lifetime for sure all right, Mike. Let's get down to the business of this all. Uh, it's been a tough. It's been a tough couple of months for everybody. Um, every state is different. 
Can you give us sort of the overview on what's happening in Idaho with respect to angling opportunities, what's happening at Drift uh, with respect to the pandemic and, and COVID, uh, and what you're doing to keep your your uh, your friends healthy and safe? Oh, the good news is, is Idaho is pretty much open right now. Uh, we do have some restrictions still on, obviously, on large groups. Uh, as fishermen, we don't worry about that. We want to keep everybody as far away as we can anyways. Um, it, and then as far as the lodge goes, we in the fly shop are limiting our, occup our occupancy in the shop. We have hand sanitizer available at the door. We do ask that you wear your mask if you have it. Um, staff will wear our masks to, to help make you feel more comfortable. We've even opened up a desk out from outside on the deck so you don't even have to come in to get your supplies or your licenses. Um, and then is the cabins, we... I'm proud to say I, there's not general, the, the standard cleaning process is pretty much what we're sticking with. However, Jamie, my wife and business partner and everything partner, we're adding the ultraviolet sanitation to every cabin. Um, we are not doing daily entry or makeup on those cabins. One, it, it's yours. Um, but everything will be pulled clean, sanitized. Yeah, I was impressed with the cleanliness of those cabins. I, it was so clean, you felt bad about getting into your bed because you were going to wrinkle the sheets. <laughs> no, That's a flat-out lie. That's a flat-out lie, Phil. We were so exhausted, you fell into every bed every true, night. True, true. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as soon as you walk into the cabins, that was the one thing is, wow, are these well-kept and clean, right? It's um, It was credit to Jamie. Uh, okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Douglas, sure she's listening. Oh. Douglas Erickson asks, um, why are there so many chubs now in Henry's Lake? Uh, I don't, I honestly, can I ask, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put this question back on YouTube. You fished for three days. You caught 250 fish approximately. How many chubs did you land? None. No, I didn't, didn't even see one. That, that think, question surprised me because I didn't know there was chubs in the lake. No, they're, and I think they're, you know, brookies, those hybrids, those cuts, if they come across one, they'll eat it. And um, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure what chub they are. Um, a lot Utah. of, what, you know, I'm not sure what they eat, um, but as long as they're not really competing for the same food, food sources of the trout, um, th they'll coexist. Uh, okay right it's it's other fish like um in some of our lakes we get perch infestations and they're they're challenging in a trout lake because they are very active over a wide temperature range they'll feed at 39 fahrenheit they'll feed at 75 fahrenheit whereas a trout is sort of that 50 to 65 degree window if i was to pick a, a spot that they like to be active and they're all eating the same thing so the, the perch breed like rabbits and eat the same stuff trout do they out compete them but in our lakes as well, we also have little minnows like fathead minnows and brook stickleback, and they don't eat the same thing. And uh, the trout just turn on them, and that's big protein, you know. And brookies, you know, brook. I know brookies like to eat sushi, so and I'm sure the Yellowstone cutthroat isn't big on the chub yeah. like a lot of the other strains of yeah. the cutthroat are. I will say. Phil brought up the food sources. Idaho Fish and Game's done a lot of studies and a very good study about three for the last three or four years on the food spectrum of each of the types of fish. Yeah. And um, the spectrum of the chubs came up completely outside the circles of the trout. Um, yeah. you, saw, you, you saw the cutthroat and the hybrids eating pretty much the same food sources. The brooks overlap partially, about 50% were the same, but they were, even the brooks were on a different food source from uh, from the other fish. Yeah, they sort so, of eat their own little niches in the water uh, as far as location, food sources, feeding behaviors, all that kind of stuff. And I think as long as those fish aren't directly competing with the, with the, with the trout, um, um, it should be okay. And you'll probably find they'll go up for a bit and then something will happen in the chub 
world that's not good and that you know that um their population dwindles a little bit but uh, something to keep an eye on now on that question i there is one thing that i do see a lot more of is the spin fishermen and the bait fishermen do see more of the chubs in henry's lake um, they are, there are chubs there, the numbers and all of the nets and everything have held pretty consistent for the last four years. Um, so I, I will qualify fly fishermen don't catch as many chubs as the spin fishermen. Mike, how many fish did we catch on that fishing trip, uh, in the video that we did in the show? I don't, I have no idea. Um, lots. <laughs> A lot. The second, the second day, I just started drifting and watching you guys. I my arm was sore, and that didn't even that didn't even go in with what you guys caught. So I know on the first day, I think I got a fish on my third cast because we were still working, um, uh, you know, where we launched the boat at the state park and just fishing yep. little minnow patterns. And I got a yeah, fish, and it was cold. It was a cold front. It yeah, just it moved in, nip, and yeah, it was a little nippy. <laughs> Um, guys, is there anything else we need to talk about? Is there anything that we haven't covered? Anything you want to mention? Uh, we've talked about, we went back to, uh, the rivers question. Um, we've got people from Russia, uh, from South Africa. This is fantastic. Um, anything, anything else you want to add, Mike, Phil? Yeah, well, can I throw one in Mark? Yeah, uh, we've got a little special event coming up in June on the 11th, a uh, little Orvis demo day. Uh -huh. So if anyone's in the area, again, we've got Sheridan Ranch booked out and a chance to go out and throw your Orvis rods and re experience the rods and reels and uh, get acquainted with the equipment that we have here in the shop. How, sure. are, how, how important is it, Phil, in your opinion, for, um, for people, to, for fly shops to offer that, to have demo days where you can go and, and throw different, different brands of rods and different, uh, different weights and, and really get to work one out? I think that's really important because, um, you know, there's a lot of great quality gear out there. And, of course, it can, some of it can get expensive and you want to make sure you make the right choice. And you pick a, a rod or a line or a reel that fits your style, right? Um, it's just like other sports, golf and skiing and those kind of things. There, there's lots of great products in, in those um, genres, but, uh, you know, the chance to play with it before, try it before you buy it, I think is cool. And it's a great way uh, for Mike to build rapport and, and loyalty with his customers as well. Not to mention Sheridan Lake's not a bad little spot to go as well. No. Right. <laughs> right. So large, large Wooly Bugger says, Hey guys, just wanted to thank you for putting videos out every day during quarantine. It's helped me keep sane. And I learned a lot along the way. So what, what Mr. Wooly Bugger is talking about is, uh, Colin McEwen, my business partner and I have, uh, been uploading videos every day to our YouTube channel, uh, full length shows as well as, um, tips and tricks, uh, including the show that we did with Phil and Mike. Uh, you can now watch the, the whole thing. It's different from the broadcast version. What we've done is because we don't have any um, because we don't have any time restrictions with respect to full length shows that we do with broadcast on Sportsman Channel or, or on WFN or PBS for that matter, we can show shows that are as long as, as they need to be. So, you know, instead of a 22 minute show, I think our drift our drift lodge shows up upwards to 40 minutes. So you've got a lot of extra tips and tip tricks and content that you can watch, check it out on the, um, uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, and Lyle Melton is asking Mike, if you can just uh, recap what you said about that trip one more time. On Phil's trip, I'm assuming. Let's do, let's, let's do both. Let's do the, let's do the Sheridan, the Sheridan Lake demo day and let's do the, uh, the, the hosted trip with Phil. The uh, Sheridan Lake is June 11th. It should be Friday, June 11th. Um, I'm limiting it to the 12 people. Uh, give us a call. I can give you all the specifics on that at the fly shop. Um, I actually have our Orvis rep coming down and bring in rods and equipment to help out and uh, help get you guys out and finding out about our equipment also. And then on Phil's trip, that is September 10th, 11th, 12th and 13th is an optional. You can fish on your way out of town day, pick up one of the other waters or whatever. Um, uh, you'll, you'll be staying here at the drift lodge. We'll be fishing Sheridan Lake one day, Henry's Lake the next day. Um, meals included. 
lousy jokes. Yeah. Lousy jokes. Lots of <laughs> lousy jokes. <laughs> and I got to defend myself somewhere. Somebody made a comment about me. Rob, Robert Spencer, how, why did Phil show up to the shop without any beer? <laughs> Yeah, you. I think you know Bob. Uh, you, yep. you, I'm sure you met Bob here. Yep. So, uh, no, you know, one, one of my. I was trying to make a good impression. I think stumbling in with armloads of beer, you know, anticipating Mark's arrival because I think I got there a little earlier. So, uh, um, yeah, be responsible. <laughs> there to fish. Hey, now look at Phil. You're in your own house. I know exactly where your beer is. So, I bet you there's one going on right now. I know I've um, that's my uh, retirement savings plan. The empties. <laughs> so for more on Phil Rowley and the world of, of stillwater fishing, please check him out at flycraftangling.com. Cool. Um, he uh, Phil's got a wealth of knowledge. He's got an app um, that is available um, that basically breaks down stillwater fly fishing uh, all over the place. Uh, he's done Tons of content and video. Phil, I'm not blowing smoke, man. You really are the stillwater guru in North America. And uh, I want to thank you for doing this. Um, for everything Mike Wilson and Jamie Wilson and everything that um, Drift Lodge and Fly Shop has to offer, please, at this time, you've got to support our guides. You've got to support our, our fly shop That's businesses. Awesome. Um, you know what? If you have trips uh, uh, planned, uh, don't cancel them um, until you absolutely have to. And for the most important thing is call the shop and be in constant communication with Garrett, with Mike, with Jamie. Um, they'll set you straight. They'll help you out. They'll get you past this. Um, and, uh, you know, I got to take this time to thank you all for, for being a part of our inaugural um, uh, our inaugural uh, broadcast here for, for Drift. Um, guys, it's only it's only going to go up from here. Uh, one more question from JC is, what's your app, Phil? Oh, the app, it's the uh, Stillwater Fly Fishing app. It's a free download on both um, Google Play and uh, iTunes. And you just simply search for Stillwater Fly Fishing app, free download. Uh, some of the content's free to watch. Some of it's subscriber-based. We've got close to 200 video tips up on there now. It's myself and Brian Chan at the moment uh, doing those tips. And um, what the good thing is, is once you download the content to your smartphone, um, you don't need Wi-Fi to access it. So you can be on the water, faced with a challenge. There's a pretty good chance we might have a tip that will help bail you out. So, uh, yeah, go over and take a look at it. And there's fly tying uh, videos on there as well, um, including some of the flies that uh, I use with good success um, on my trip to Henry's. Uh, the uh, black beaver and tan, the baby leech and the bruised balance leech. Uh, and Mark, we we also have pulled most of fly, Phil's line, Phil and Brian's line of flies in here into the shop also. So, well, thank you for, for the for the pe for the people here in Idaho and southern Montana that want to come in. We can help you out there also. Well, I don't have to bring my flies in. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no discount for you, Phil. All right, Mike, anything else you want to cover? I, I At this point, no. I just want – I look forward to seeing everybody come in. I, the, this season is going to be great fishing up here. Uh, yeah, there is one thing. I think our crowds are going to be way down and the number of people that we're going to be seeing. What a great time to get up here and experience this area like it used to be. Fantastic. Fantastic. So contact Mike Wilson at Drift Lodge and Fly Shop for all your Henry's Lake and surrounding bodies of water needs. If there's anybody that you want to see me uh, um, and the crew from the new Fly Fisher interview, please leave a message in the in the comments below. We'll be more than happy to hook it up, um, whether it's a, a, a fly angler or not, we can we can make it happen. Um, Guys, thank you so much. This uh, actually technologically, it went off without a hitch, I think. Yeah, I, I'm quite impressed. <laughs> All right. Have a great season. Everybody, fish well. Support your local guides. Get out fishing, everybody. I'm Mark Melnick for the New Fly Fisher. Thanks very much for having us. We'll see you again. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.